quick introduction. Tom Schuen is from, he's a well-known contractor in California, and he's going to be discussing uh, day mutual uh, substrate and uh, soil-based systems. Um, 
and uh, so it, it does allow water to go through, but it does prevent the roots from going down into the underlying soil, which we wanted to be able to put this onto non-fumigated soil. The, the, what we're looking at in particular, could we grow strawberries in a substrate, say on edges of fields where you weren't allowed to fumigate close to occupied structures, schools, etc. Um, could this be an alternative uh, production system? And then um, we filled these troughs with either peat or core-based substrates. And we also actually tried amending field soil and putting them in the trough. And then the plants are fertilized continuously through drip irrigation lines. So this shows you what the raised bed trough looks like before you fill it with the substrate. And this is our wide beds that are typically used in Santa Maria and in Ventura County. These are 64 inch beds, I think, from Santa Maria. And they got one, two, three, four separate lines that are filled. And I'll talk about this leachate collection system in a few minutes. And then this is what it looks like for a two row system. Two row beds on 48 to 52 inch centers are common in the Watsonville Salinas area. And these are 52-inch center beds here at the uh, Strawberry Commission's uh, research site at the Monterey Bay Academy on the coast of Watsonville. You can see it's a very foggy area. Um, but it's two troughs that are filled with substrate on those beds. Now, switch back to Santa Maria. This is our first year of trials. There's my wife helping out. <laughs> Uh, this uh, picture is in an article in California Agriculture. Unfortunately, they cropped K out of the picture, but uh, you can see these guys. And what we've done, we have the substrates. In the first year in Santa Maria, we were using a, a uh, two-trough system where we had two plant lines in each trough. And that didn't work as well as having an individual trough, so we did, in the later years, switch to four-trough system in Santa Maria. You can see here they're applying the plastic mulch over the troughs that are filled with substrate. We had tried all sorts of different uh, substrates. We had uh, we wanted something cheaper than than perlite, so we tried amending peat. We we're mixing peat with rice hulls that are readily available in California and, and in the southern U.S. states. Um, uh, we tried <coughs> perlite. We tried 100% peat. We tried. Uh, this sandier soil in Santa Maria amended with 50% uh, peat. So we, we tried a, a, a lot of different things. And uh, uh, some work better than others. But here they are applying the mulch over the top. And of course the drip line is already in there. There's K. Uh, and then this is... Uh, so we pre-irrigate the troughs and then punch. Uh, you've seen some examples of the uh, punch devices that's used to, for mark plant spacing. This is typical in the Watsonville area. Uh, an iron wheel with uh, some metal probes that punch a nice slot to make it easier to plant the plant. And the plants are set to a substrate. It it's, um, takes a lot of supervision of the planting crew. They're used to being able to plant in soil where you just you have that nice slot, you slip the plant into the, the slot that you formed in the bed and just give it a little push on the side of the bed and it closes up. But with substrate, you've got to make sure that you've got the plant at the right plant. It's very easy to plant too deep or too shallow. Too shallow seems to be the biggest problem. And part of it's our own fault because the substrate maybe will settle after um, several irrigations and we haven't done enough pre-irrigation to get the substrate settled into the trough. All right, so, first trials in the fall of 2008 in Santa Maria and Watsonville, and then the following year we tried a trial in Oxnard. Um, and, and originally we just tried to grow these like we would a regular strawberry field, irrigating it two or three times a week, uh, um, and use control release fertilizers with liquid supplements. That was a big mistake. We made a lot of mistakes too, Tom. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we didn't mean for this to happen, but in practice we ended up being late on getting the supplemental fertilizer started. 
sometimes four weeks, five weeks after planting, and that was disastrous because substrates just do not hold fertility, and whatever fertility they come with gets leached out very quickly. Um, and you could see it right away. We had lagging plant growth in the substrates in comparison to our standard grow beds and, and trials. And we had very poor early season yields. And of course, for places like Oxnard, that's a disaster. The money's made in January, February um, down there, and we wouldn't even have decent production until late February in Oxnard. Uh, so we really uh, lost a lot of money on our trials those first couple of years. And we had big irrigation problems. With substrates, you have to have very precise control over irrigation. Uh, using standard drip tapes, we had a lot of problems getting uniform distribution of the water. Um, if there was too much slope in the field, the, the water would all run down, seemed like, to the low end of the field, and the, and the plants at the high end would be dry. Um, and you, it was hard to get the water to move across the, 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 the trough as well. <clears throat> so, here are some of the things we did to make it better. First of all, the Starby Commission got wise and hired their own research team. So they'd have some people there 24-7, uh, seven days, you know, 365, I should say, seven, seven days if necessary a week and uh, 365 days a year available to help out. I was working part-time on this uh, and I wasn't about to be able to give them the, the time required to fiddle with these systems. They're very, very labor-intensive from the standpoint of management. Um, we got Dwight Rowe and Shiv Reddy from, from SunGrow to join the, the team as substrate experts. Of course, they had a vested interest. They wanted to sell substrates. Um, Cliff Lowe was a great addition to our team. Cliff has worked in the Watsonville area for many years with ornamental growers using substrates for in glasshouse production, uh, things like potted roses and other potted plants. So he had a great deal of expertise on fertility and substrates. And then we abandoned the, the pre-plant pre fertilizers and switched to controlled release fertilizers. We also began our fertigation as soon as we planted. Hopefully the same day we planted, we, we started fertigating. And then we did recognize that every substrate had its own optimum irrigation fertility schedule. Uh, we couldn't do that ourselves. We had to, you know, we, we, there was no way we could plumb the system in these trials to get exactly the right mix of fertilizer. But we did find that, you know, there, we had to recognize this is a very important thing that each substrate is going to need its own irrigation scheduling and fertility. Um, and we use, like Tom was saying, a whole list of uh, essential nutrients for plant growth in the substrate system. And, very important, we use guidelines developed in Europe by Philip Leiton um, and others in Europe. I really, that, that helped tremendously. And, we changed to pressure compensating drip systems that are expensive, but they're reusable. We monitored the volumes of water uh, and the quality water by a leachate collection system. And we actually based our irrigation target on how much leachate volume we were getting and what the quality was of the, uh, the leachate, primarily measured EC there. And we were looking for 20% leaching, if our water quality was good enough. In Santa Maria, it's typical to have ECs over two once you add fertilizer to the well water. And so we went to 25 to 30% leaching in, in Santa Maria. And then we monitored the, effect, the effectiveness of the irrigation with Decagon sensors, which helped guide us in terms of how often to irrigate. Now, with these systems, by the time you reach production in the spring time with these, these are fall planted production systems in California and by the time you reach um, heavy production you're irrigating six to eight times every day so they're short pulses of a few minutes oops did it, did it there. okay good uh, this was our first system using a single tank of fertilizer uh, with a dosatron injection system well, we found out we had precipitation problems doing that. There's quite a bit of calcium in the, the well water in California. And 
and so we were having precipitation problems. So we went to a two tank system and uh, that helped a lot. Still using dosotrons at this point. Um, here's our leachate collection system, very simple, just a, a um, poly tube cut and lengthwise, it's about 10 feet long, and uh, um, it's got uh, just plastic pieces glued on each end uh, with a hole in it to collect the, the water in this 10 feet, and it's sloped enough so it'll drain into buckets sunk into the soil. Down in this end and the lower end, we've got buckets. <coughs> And this is what it looks like when it's in the field. You've got, you can see the little, little bit of the, for those of you close enough can see, there's the one end of the plastic trough, and it's underneath our woven plastic, our woven uh, fabric, and then down here you've got the buckets that are underneath the, the lid. And that's monitored every day during the season. That's important to measure the leachate volume daily. Um, and then we would adjust our uh, irrigation volumes to, to try to target 20% leaching and, and, uh, or more if EC was too high. And there you can see an improvements in the system over, this is a standard raised bed, fumigated, uh, soil-based bed in Santa Maria. Pretty typical of what it would look like um, in January. It's, it was probably planted around the first week of November. This is the kind of growth they typically get by January. You see a little bit of yellowing in the plants. There's a fair amount of salt in the soil and the irrigation water. But here is our trough system. And you see much improved plant growth. And in, and in our experience, that early plant growth is a very good indication of potential yield in these day neutrals. Um, we see, uh, you know, if we can get this kind of Healthy growth that's fairly horizontal, spreading across the bed, that's typically a good sign that you've got good production potential and strong. Oh, we do have a problem. Okay. Um, so we decided we had to go past the dosatron system. We just weren't getting the control on our fertilizer injection. And uh, we went to a computerized system. There's some European. Uh, just a couple names of them, Creva and Ferdinand. And um, we tried to refine the nutrient requirements, especially the, especially the level and timing of nitrogen. And uh, we began to see some consistencies and differences among substrates. And we found that peat-based substrates were the best uh, system, easiest to work with. Core would work pretty good, but it's, it's not as forgiving. Here's a picture of a Creva system. Uh, and uh, uh, let me give you some results here. So we had these replicated trials in Watsonville that looked at substrate types, volumes, and nutrition. We looked at 60-40 peat core, which was working well for us in preliminary trials, 100% core. Soil amended with core, recycled and locally sub sourced substrates. Uh, we've been trying to reduce substrate volumes. It's worked out pretty well. Um, we started out with about um, 8 liters per plant, 7.5 to 8 liters per plant, which is about 2 gallons per plant, and then we, we've got it down now to about 4 liters per plant. We tried different uh, early nitrogen levels, working in parts per million of 40, 80, and 120 parts per million. This shows you our initial fertility program. This, I think will be available, right? So you don't have to worry about the numbers here. Uh, and then for a comparison, this is what the Europeans were targeting in the publications that Philip Leighton has published. And we were, at, now look at the pH down at the bottom here. 5.5 five we ended up going to in these substrates. You know, typically in California, we're, we're working around the best 6.5, quite often 6.8, even 7.2 on pHs in our soil-based systems. But we were having very good results at 5.5 five in these substrate systems. Um, and we're injecting a 1 to 250 ratio. Uh, we, our two-tank system, we got the calcium nitrate that, that Tom likes, and we do too. We like to have 
make sure you keep the calcium up if you can. And we also have potassium nitrate in the mix with another nitrogen source. And then we have our um, micronutrients in there as well. And then when we get to fruiting, we cut back typically on the nitrogen level. Again, we're hitting 5.5 uh, five with a pH. And we can, we can just skip right through this. You can check these details later. So the results. We had good production. We terminated these trials early um, by mid-August because we had to get ready for the following year's trial. We didn't have ground to rotate on. Uh, but by mid-August, our best study treatments, we were getting 40,000 pounds per acre. Um, so we were in that, the target range we wanted to be at. That should translate to over 60,000 pounds by the end of October. Um, and we had a pretty significant uh, correlation of uh, early growth with yields by 1st of February, end of January, 1st of February. We could I, I could actually predict yields pretty accurately for the first half of the season just by looking at visual plant growth. And the best substrate, again, was the 60-40 peak core. Straight core was about 15%, significantly lower in this trial. And then the amended soil treatments were 25% below the peak core on average. Uh, and we've pretty much given up on using amended soil. Um, Interesting thing happened. Uh, we actually had better yields when we reduced the substrate volume down to four liters per plant, uh, about 20% higher yield. I <coughs> hope that's reproducible. Uh, this one I'm not sure of what's going on here. We actually had higher yields of 40 parts per million at the start and 120 parts per million when we compared it against our standard of 80 parts per million nitrogen. Uh, in the first few months of growth. I, the problem with this result is it's, it's difficult to get everything exactly the same. You have to use a different valve and different, uh, you know, you're, you're, to get these nitrogen levels. And based on our soil sample readings, I, I don't think we were at 40 parts per million in this treatment. But anyway, it needs to be looked at again. Um, and we had about a 15% yield loss when we tried to reuse core from previous year. We actually pulled core out of troughs from previous year trough and put it back in, leached it the best we could, um, and uh, it just it performed pretty well, but about 15% lower yielding. And then there was a redwood product available locally, from redwood bark and sawdust combination. Uh, mixed with other forest byproducts that actually will perform pretty well, about the same as the core. So there's some other materials that might be available. Um, <coughs> these are three of the fellows on the team, Dwight Rowe from uh, Sun Grove, Dan McGard from the Strawberry Commission, and then Cliff Lowe on the right, uh, who's our uh, fertility expert in substrate culture. Is there time for... Yeah, we have questions too. Okay. I do have a few things about the soil based systems. I don't know if you look at one or two, but anyway, I can talk about that. So, so that's okay. Big question how much is all this going to cost? It costs a lot of money. Uh, even at four meters per plant, you're looking at about $4,000 additional in a two row system just for the subject. Good news is if you can do it, and there is some hope that you can use. Um, Oh, some names are escaping me right now. Um, this uh, alternative fumigation process, it's a biological fumigation process where you're basically spiking the, the carbon ratio in the substrate um, and, and uh, saturating the substrate for a period of 30 days. You can get uh, a spike in, in the biologicals that will suppress pathogens in strawberries. This has been done in both field and substrate systems. Joji Miramoto at UC Santa Cruz has done some really good trials with this system. And we've been using rice bran as a carbon source incorporated in the substrates. There is some hope here that we can maybe normalize our yields in the second year by applying this treatment to the subject. It would require that you remove the overlying plastic and drip 
and then because you have to do a good job incorporating the rice bran into the substrate, but it is possible. Is that that anaerobic? Yeah, and ASD. Thank you. <laughs> and anaerobic soil disinfestation. Yes, Tom. Tom, did, did anything that you learned about fertilizing the substrate system does any of that translate into any different kind of recommendations for fertilizing the conventional soil system? You know, I think it's it. It does translate well, because uh, Rudy Heeman, you know Rudy from Ontario, that's growing, uh, he's growing albums very successfully in a sandy soil in Ontario, southwestern Ontario, and he showed me what he's using to fertilize, and it's very, very close uh, in terms of the ratios, I mean, you work it out, because he's using a, a fertigation system for his state intervals, for his albums, and having very good success. Uh, so I'm thinking, yes, that, uh, you know, in a way, this learning on substrate is a more pure system in that, you know, you're free of a lot of the interactions that you have in soil-based systems. And maybe, yes, we can learn. So we had very good growth in these trials once we got the irrigation and fertilization dialed in. Um, and we were routinely out yielding the soil-based, fumigated soil-based system with a non-fumigated substrate system. So is, is this system at this point economic or anybody, is it being implemented in California at all? You know, we got to the point where we got it up to about 10 acres, <laughs> of course with some subsidies from the Strawberry Commission. <laughs> we had about four sites in California of around two plus acres apiece uh, with the substrates in addition to our own replicated trials. Uh, the, the people right now that seem to be most active with substrates are the Driscoll people. And I think if anybody's going to lead the way, it'll probably be the Driscoll research team. Uh, they're looking at substrates in a lot of areas. Uh, they're having some pretty good success with blackberries and blueberries down in uh, the Oxnard district, which is a tough area for soil-based culture, particularly blueberries with the high pH and salts in the soils down there. So it looks encouraging for that, whether somebody will really pick it up with it and run with the strawberries. I don't know. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on what fumigants are available in the future and costs, other costs. Because if we could get three years out of the substrate, three crop cycles, well then you're really, you know, you're taking that $4,000 and dividing it by three, basically. Um, there are some recurring costs uh, to happen, but not a lot. Uh, and you know, fumigation's getting up around four grand an acre, so... You know, you're, yeah, I think fully loaded, you because of the drip and all that, you are looking at probably six or seven or even eight thousand dollars additional cost per acre with this substrate system. Um, and then when you go to higher plant densities like they have in Southern California, your, your costs do go up more. But we may be able to reduce the volumes even further in some of those areas where they have a fairly short crop cycle. And they're basically all done in Oxnard by you know, April 15th, planting in 1st of October. They're not growing that plant for a long period of time. What's interesting about plants that's grown in substrate, when you get to the end of the season and pull them out, it's a mass of white roots. They look very healthy. It's not a big root system because it's been confined by the, the fabric, uh, but it's healthy, it's white, it's much healthier looking at least than, than what you see on the, in a field based system at that time of the year. I think the important thing is we learn a lot, and it's there for people to learn. You can take it to the next level. Yeah, this might be a question for Tom Bowman and Tom Shulin, um, but stepping back a little bit, Thinking about nutrient management for the plasticulture system, you've both worked with a lot of different growers. What are the most common, not necessarily mistakes, but you know, challenges that transitional growers encounter with nutrient management? Irrigation has turned out to become a big, big issue, particularly the uniforming of irrigation down the road and from bed to bed in California. The Strawberry Commission has a big educational program now underway where they're working with the irrigators in the field 
um, showing them tools they need to accurately measure pressure and volumes in the field. Because you know, we see pressure on a gauge and we think, yeah, we're right, you know? And it's a gauge that's way upstream in the process. But you start looking at pressure and flow on an individual bed basis, it varies tremendously. Uh, so that's, I think, the number one issue that, that even after all these years of drip irrigation in California, uh, it's, you know, we've had it pretty good down there for a long time. Um, and uh, I think now we've got to optimize everything we do and, and not have, you know, everybody talks about these high yields in California, but if you do the math of what's officially published, the average yields, yeah, they're great, but they're not as great as everybody claims they are. I think everybody goes out and measures the best one acre or half acre, and that's what they talk about. You know, you hear these, oh yeah, 100,000 you know, pounds per acre, 120 or whatever. You, know, you look at the numbers that come out, I don't know where that fruit's going, because it sure isn't showing up in the survey commission and <laughs> records. Anyway, there's a lot of work left to be done in California on irrigation. Uh, to me, uh, there's over irrigation. Clearly, I've accused one grower trying to grow rice once. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's over irrigating. I see it in the raspberries, I see it in the blueberries too. Uh, people tend to keep on watering, and when the plants then show stress on the top, uh, it looks like uh, they are not getting enough water, then they over irrigate even more. Uh, and the root system is slowly dying away. Yeah. So that's, but uh, I, I absolutely loved how you analyzed this uh, down. It was almost like greenhouse growing. Uh, the next step would be a grow down system with, uh, in pots or something like that uh, yeah. on the field, as they do in Holland, uh, especially with blueberries. And I've seen a system in trust with uh, strawberries too. Um, there's lots of um, room left to grow on land that normally can't be uh, grown on with those kinds of systems. Uh, pH, though, so in soil versus not in soil, there's, there's, a, there's a difference, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas in greenhouse production and uh, in those kind of soilless media, uh, I almost wanted to eat your soil there, you know, what is this and, and this meal and whatever. Uh, the pH is usually better at a lower end, uh, and in soil it's usually, for strawberries anyway, uh, on the higher end, 6.5. Yeah, I'm curious. That's what we were saying too. It was kind of puzzling, but <laughs> I guess that's what we found out. <laughs> In the back. I um, want uh, to know why it was necessary to fumigate uh, the media because substrate should be uh, disease-free. I mean, any pest-free. Yeah. Yeah. Good question because. <coughs> What happens in the, with the current materials we're using as a trough liner, there is some movement of the roots through the fabric by the end of the season into the underlying soil. Um, so I think we are maybe picking up some of those soil-based pathogens. You know, we're seeing, we've seen late in the season some symptoms of verticillium in places where we know verticillium is a problem. Um, and, and, and this was, this Monterey Bay Academy site was a pretty tough place to be because uh, we not only had this long history of verisilium on the site, uh, which is encouraged by researchers to do trials on verisilium, uh, but we also accidentally introduced fusarium into this site. And so I think the real world is that anybody that tries to do a trough system is going to be faced with some contam level of contamination. So the um, anaerobic soil disinfection and disinfestation tool is a possible tool to use in that situation. If you think you've got contamination in your substrate, here's something that may be able to correct that. But you're right, under normal situation, if you've got clean plants coming in, your system should remain clean, and it should hopefully perform well for two, maybe three seasons. I don't know. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you both.